I'll just take the lead. Okay, so Professor Pettit, thank you so much for uh, having having us here and uh, allowing us to prod your brain about republicanism and its contemporary applications. Um, we so Pleasure. of course. Um, so we're we're going to be separating our questions largely into sort of four categories. The first is on sort of your conception of republicanism, it's the most famous, and um, its contemporary applications. Uh, then we wanted to ask you a little bit more about the sort of relationship between your version of republicanism and the sort of historical work that has been done on that um, by those like Skinner and Pocock. Um, and then Brian will be talking to you a little bit more about um, sort of your recent writings on academic freedom uh, and your sort of meta-ethics and some maybe theoretical issues on that. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to start um, with your neo-republicanism. And the first thing I wanted to ask is, I think, going to be uh, pretty popular. Um, your version of republicanism has been adopted wholesale by the Spanish government. And um, I wanted to ask you about how you conceptualized the relationship broadly between your sort of theoretical conception and how it was sort of implemented in practice. Um, and I guess just the first, the first question is, could you just talk to us a little bit about how that came about? Um, who, you know, did he reach out to you and sort of what was going through your head when that was going on? I understand what happened was that um, Zapatero came to the leadership of the PSOE, the Socialist Party, the Labour Party, if you like, in uh -huh. uh, Spain in uh, about 2000. And uh, he was a new leader. It, he actually, you know, was not the favourite candidate. He was, not, he was a surprise victor. Right. And um, I'm told by his aides, or was told by his aides, that he was really interested in having a guiding political philosophy that would, you know, that he could refer back to, you know, rather right. than <clears throat> as we're making a policy on the hoof that he would have this constant reference. Right. And apparently read widely through um, many varieties of political philosophy. And my book, Republicanism, which was published in English in 1997, had just been translated into Spanish. Mm. And um, so that was one of the books he read. And um, he decided to adopt, you know, this way of thinking as his, um, as his philosophy of government. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the book was subtitled, if you remember, Theory of Freedom and Government. So it, it was presented as a, a basis on which you could build a whole raft of social policies right. with deep historical roots. And, of course, I think it appealed to him also because... Um, his father or grandfather had been associated with the Republican movement in Spain, mm. not pre-Franco. I see. And um, so I think it may have had a certain sentimental appeal. But he, he was, he, he really got to know the, you know, the principles, as I think of them as the Republican approach. Right. Extremely well, and was very clear-sighted in seeing implications for policymaking of that approach. Right. Um, just to follow up, so you, there was one kind of quote that I remember reading um, where you told him, uh, I think maybe during your, one of your first lectures there, that the Republican principles were hard to live up to. Ah, yes, right. I know what you're talking about. <laughs> it was in, in 2004 he invited me to give a lecture. Right. He had just been elected. Again, a surprise victor because in that election, if you remember, as now was expected to win, mm -hmm. but some days before there was a horrible bombing in Madrid, mm -hmm. and uh, as now and his government uh, blamed it on ETA, the Basque separatist movement, when it was pretty clear it was it was the work of um, of um, of the same group as had been responsible for the bombing in New York in uh, in two thousand and one. Wow. And so, um, when that became not it, that became known just before the election, I think there was a swing away from the Asnar party to so Zapatero ends up as prime minister. He had actually invited me to Spain in two thousand three, but I couldn't go, and uh, he invited me to two thousand four. He's just been elected in March of two thousand four, and uh, it's a very large gathering. Although it's um, it's if I remember an invited audience. Um, 
of people, I suppose, associated with government and the party. Mm -hmm. And he's going to reply to my speech, which I give, and in the course of my speech, I turn to him. And he has introduced one policy, which he has um, identified as a policy supported by the Republican approach. Of course, it's supported by lots of other approaches too. Right. But he actually cites my book, if I remember on that, or cited my book on it. Um, that policy was one of making the national broadcaster into um, a really uh, an independent broadcaster. So not operating at the behest or pleasure of government, but quite independent, like the BBC. Right. And I turned in the course of my lecture, I said to him, you know, that was a terrific sort of policy move. I absolutely approve. And I hope there are many of, of that kind, as there were, actually. But I said, um, what you must remember, it's very easy for someone like me, you know, <laughs> work through the history or the right, theory right, right. and come up with sort of principles like this, but it's going to be extraordinarily difficult for you mm -hmm. to live up to them because, um, I said, a year's time, this broadcaster that you met independent may be your worst critic. And you're going to find a very strong temptation to pick up that phone, you know, I speak see. to the director and try to put some pressure on him. And he was very fired up by that, actually. He, he very quite a passionate man, very principled man, but quite passionate. And uh, in his response, rather than talking about my lecture, uh -huh. he invited me to, uh, he was insistent that he would live up to this, these principles. And he invited me to write a review of his, his government right. six months before the next election to judge his government on how far it had lived up to these principles. It was quite extraordinary because he had met me personally for the first time just before going onto that stage. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> and so <laughs> I was put in a position beauty. of do I accept or not? Right. Actually, at the time, it really wasn't something that appealed to me. You know, I had my own plans about what I wanted to do, and I realized that was going to be very time consuming. But then someone stood up in the audience and said, My foundation, who was someone the head of the foundation, will support this research and so on, am I coming and going to Spain? I see. So I had to accept, and um, and that's how I ended up reviewing his government in 2007. God. I was never an advisor to his government. Some people often say I was. I was never an advisor. Did he, so did he, he offer did, you the job? He, he asked me to be an advisor before going uh -huh. out on stage. Uh -huh. And I said to him as we came off, um, or later at some point, I said to him, look, it's very nice of you to ask me to advise, though I'd said, you know, I don't know how much a philosopher can really advise a government because so much <laughs> policy is dictated by empirics and so on. Right. Um, but I said to him, I can't be an advisor if I'm also the reviewer, you know, That's as an right. old Republican. Well, it's not entirely Republican, it's certainly sat in the tradition right. of Nemo Udix and Sua Causa, no one to be judging his own cause. You know, I see. Be, obviously, I'd have a conflict of interest. I see. So, so when you said that it was hard to live up to some of these principles, you actually just meant that it was hard for the leaders maybe to follow those principles given that it might be against their self-interest. Exactly. I mean, so for example, putting the country first, you know, as we know, can be extraordinarily difficult from the head of the political party. I mean, think of so many countries you might name in the, in the, in the world today, you know, like is, is Mrs. May working for the good of Britain or is she working for the good of the Conservative Party? Right. It often seems to me that it's the Conservative Party that is at the core of her concerns. Mm. That seems to me to be a, it's not a corruption in any formal legal sense, mm. but it's certainly a, a departure from what good politics and good government should be about. I see. Um, so you mentioned that you had to give a report later on. Um, so the, how many years was that after? That 2007. 2007. I, I wrote... Um, my lecture and presented it in July 2007, and then the next election was early 2008. So it was just about six months before the, before the following election. Got it. Um, and and I, th I think I read a little bit of the report, and I had a question about sort of how... So there was a section on... Um, there was a section that you reported about admitting more women into government, and apparently the track record on that was quite... Good on Zapatero's part. On his part, on yes. his part. Um, and so I, th I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about. Um, well, so there was a section in that where you said something like, you know, I'm not sure about the status, I don't, I'm not sure about quotas, but I do think that, you know, the idea of a balanced government is in line with Republican values. And 
that sort of that made me want to ask whether you think you know if Republican values about are about ends, then what do you what do you think are the legitimate means to reach those ends? So if our you know the status of quotas, if you had an objection to the status to quotas, what values are you taking in? Are are they also from Republican values? Well, in the, in in this case, I would say yes, and and he always tried to organize his um, his policies around a principal basis related to the core Republican idea, which was always, I mean, he made no dominación in, uh, in Spanish, mm -hmm. a great sort of catch cry, right. um, where in the Republican traditions I interpret many others too, I'm not the only Republican, as you all know, we'll get onto that I know later in the right. discussion. Um, the idea is that freedom requires that you are not dominated um, you may be dominated, someone may have power over you mm. um, in the range of as were your personal freedom and not actually interfere with you, but you've still lost your freedom if you live under that dominating power. Right. And equally, you know, an agency like a government may obviously interfere with you, but not be dominating if it's democratically constrained and controlled. So right. those are the two big sort of uh, issues. Now, I remember in one interview with him, and I had a number where you know I obviously had to quiz him on various policies and ask him to justify them in Republican terms. And he was he was always quite ready and extremely um, forthcoming in doing that. So on the women front, for example, right. I remember him um, in one interview really striking the table, you know, mm -hmm. with his fist and saying to me, "Who are the most dominated people in the world?" And, um, hmm. you know, I would say nothing because, you know, it was obviously rhetorical as a question. And then he went, women, women, women. And so that was a, an application. I mean, in the book, I do talk about the connection between Republican theory and feminism. I mean, hmm. in the 97 book. And uh, he took that up strongly. I mean, he didn't need me to help him see it. And was very anxious in a range of areas. Right that women's position in law would be strengthened and the, their position in culture would shift so that right. they no longer would suffer, as he saw it, the sort of domination or the presumptive power of men in relation to them. So right. he thought of the quota system as a way of pushing, for example, uh, corporations mm -hmm. uh, to give women a greater voice in the decision making of a corporation by requiring a quota. Um, right. There was a figure he was certainly looking for. I'm not sure however far this was, whatever the, to what extent this was actually realized, of 40% in every board of women. Right. And equally in his own, in his own uh, cabinet. I think at one stage there may actually have been a majority of women in his own cabinet. And so he, he felt very strongly that you needed to make that sort of step forward, you know, mm -hmm. with the quota, mm -hmm. to actually get over the, you know, the, the lack, um, right. the, the, the problem that was there bequeathed by history. And so he introduced a range of, of legislation all related mm -hmm. to, well, in effect women, although not always, let's say one was um, legislation against domestic abuse, mainly, of course, the abuse of women by men, which was new to the Spanish world. Uh, legislation in right. favor of, I'm now working from memory, but legislation in favor of those giving care mm. and being uh, actually receiving a recognition reimbursement from the state, again, mainly women in that position. Legislation requiring that women have, like the quota, that women have a certain percentage of jobs in various and have a presence in, in various aspects of public life. Mm -hmm. Very insistent on that, as he was actually. He thought that um, he thought that uh, homosexuals suffered, um, you know, discrimination and in effect domination of being exposed to, and so one of the. I mean, it's very remarkable actually, because that was this is Catholic Spain and was not a policy even the party was behind particularly, let alone mm -hmm. the country. Right. But he introduced homosexual marriage. I think it was just the third legislature in the world yeah. that made gay marriage um, legal. 
and he got that passed with um, I think about 64-65% um, support among the population mm. having begun for much lower than that by his sheer dint of persuasion and he used it all the time uh, this phrase of no domination and this will be domination if these people are second best yeah. and he used also something that I quite like to associate with the idea of you know being free in the sense of not being dominated which is the eyeball test I mean in right. an actual you, you address to parliament yeah. you know he said which of you can expect someone gay to look you in the eye without reason for fear or deference right. if you were saying you know your intimate relationships are not worthy of the same institutional legal recognition as the intimate relationships of uh, of uh, heterosexual people. Mm -hmm. I'd just like to sort of follow up on this point because I think from the discussion so far it seems that there's actually a lot of potentiality uh, in identifying connection between your work on freedom as non domini and, and some more sort of recent uh, I would say critical theoretical approaches to understanding oppression and the way oppression often intersects itself or manifests itself in that you can be dominated and also dominate or dominate at the same time. So you might be someone who suffers from sexism, but then you are then complicit in perpetrating racism yourself. So it's how would you perhaps, Professor, do, do you think the synergy and room for sort of gelling the two critiques of oppression on one hand and critiques of domini and under your Republican framework together in a new theory of social justice or egalitarianism? I think wherever there is oppression, there's, there's not. I mean, oppression basically means uh, a form of interference, yeah. and presumably it's a form of interference in a presumptive sphere where a person should be autonomous. That's what I think of as the sphere of the basic fundamental freedoms, yeah. as the Republican tradition has always described them. Mm -hmm. And uh, it needs the law to identify, of course, what that sphere is. Mm -hmm. It isn't given by nature. Um, oppression is when, you know, others can, so to speak, dictate what you, how you choose within this presumptively autonomous sphere. Now, um, it's always, almost always assumed that the oppressor mm -hmm. is exercising a power that belongs to him or her or them uh, in oppressing and interfering in that way. And to the extent to which they have the power they're already dominated. It's really worth it's really worth thinking about this. I mean, think of domination is not something I do. Domination is something that comes about by virtue of my relationship with you. Mm, okay. So if I have the power of interfering, more or less at will, I mean, this comes in degrees, obviously, but to the extent to which I have a power of interfering in your personal sphere, uh, without let or hindrance, you know, or penalty, with impunity, and um, to that extent, I, I dominate you. Now, of course, I could have that power, mm -hmm. and I could, you know, think of, I often use the analogy, Torvald in a doll's house, you know, the husband. Oh, yes. He's got all the power. Right. He loves Nora, you know, he mm -hmm. dotes on Nora. Right. So he doesn't interfere with her. But she's still not free because she's dominated. Why is she not free? Well, because it's his will that is in control. She can act as she wills, but only conditional on his will yeah. going along with that. Should his will change, she can't act as she wills. So she is dependent on his will, his will, she's subject to it, you know, put under it. Now domination of that kind can occur, as I say, without interference, and it's still bad. But of course domination accompanied by interference is even worse. Yeah. And really, when we talk about oppre oppression, it's usually a form of dominating mm -hmm. interference. The word oppression, though, is, is a, it's a sort of, uh, it's got a, as not it, a sort of valence, you know, yes. it's associated very much with uh, cultural power, for example, mm -hmm. rather than, um, at least in ordinary usage, maybe cultural power more than, but also economic power, I suppose people talk about, you know, uh, employers or whatever, mm. corporations oppressing people. Um, but, and I embrace the term. I mean, it's, it's, it's fine. It just doesn't seem to stretch as widely as interference yeah. does. And I think if you think oppression is the only problem, you know, you're going to be centered on the areas where that's the natural term to use rather than, you know, having your normative right. uh, compass, so to speak, yeah. extended. Yeah. Um, 
one one more follow up on this. So this is again kind of back to this um, to the sort of relationship to critical theorists. Yes. Um, so in the critical the, the critical, critical theory in the Frankfurt sense, or not, not the generally. Frankfurt sense, but yeah. just more generally the sort of yeah the study of oppression. I'm yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, they tend to um, sort of emphasize private domination. I mean, they have a, yes. they they tend to critique both the sort of the private public divide yes, yes. itself. Yeah. Um, and in your view, you have this kind of you know private domination and public domination needs yeah. to be. Are, are both problematic for you. And I was wondering whether you thought that there might sometimes be a tension in, you know, in order to remedy private domination, yes. there might be some susceptibility yeah. to public domination. Of course. Um, yeah. and, and this reminds me of the sort of affirmative action debate, because there's this kind of view that, yes. you know, affirmative action is a, a way of remedying private domination, yeah. but has this sort of danger of public domination. Mm because it is the sort of state or the school that is enforcing a law that is affecting individual choices. Right. Okay, let me just go back to uh, some of you said at the, at the beginning. I mean, like uh, the people who are critical theorists, I, I think myself too that the public-private divide is a construct itself yeah. okay. of law and culture. Um, that's why I said at the beginning that, you know, there's a presumptively autonomous sphere which the law itself has got to define. Okay. It isn't given by nature. Mm. So there isn't a public-private, although, of course, uh, it's nature allows us more readily draw that divide mm. um, at some points rather than at others. I think it's an important divide to draw because you need for, unless you've got a very different view from what I have of politics and, and human life, you need to have an area for an individual where they know that they are their own boss and uh, of course in the natural world of human life they will actually reach from that position of strength where they are their own boss uh, to form friendships and relationships and loving relationships you know romantic relationships or whatever family relationships that do of course constrain that sphere you know um, but they're always in it they enter it from a position of strength and ideally, I think they have to be able to exit it as well, else that sphere can become itself, uh, I mean, else that relationship can become itself dominating. But now, on the issue, so that's one, that's common ground, mm -hmm. okay, that this divide has to, is constructed, not born, so right. to speak. Um, there are two, um, I think the Republican terms, what always appealed to me about them, is that give, they give you two clearly different areas of concern. One is the area where you can have domination without interference, or with interference, but, and that's in the area of, let's call it private life, in the relationship between people, for example, it rises all the time, mm. in the relationship between corporations and people, in the relationship between groups and, and people within families and so on. But that's one sort of problem, domination without, um, uh, without interference. The other is, uh, of course, that arises actually across the board, that sort of problem. But one other issue is, can you have interference without domination? Mm -hmm. And that's an important theme as well. It's a much more specific theme than the domination without interference. Mm -hmm. it's, can you, because in some cases, it seems to me the state is inescapable. Um, you know, anarchism just simply doesn't get to square one, so to speak. It's a historical, it seems to me, almost inevitability and it's inescapability. Right. So the real issue with the state is it's going to interfere with us, of course, it always does. It determines the basic liberties, it constrains us, we pay taxes and so on. The question there is, can we constrain the state democratically so that it's, um, it's not going to dominate us even while it interferes? Think of that as one big area of political philosophy. Think of it as democratic theory, or if you like, the theory of legitimacy, or of political justice, our relationship to the government. But the other uh, big area is obviously the area of social justice. Right. And my slight worry about pinning too much to oppression is that it, it steers you naturally to certain, not all, but to certain issues of social justice. It steers you away from 
democratic justice, yeah. you know, that doesn't look any longer like, you know, the right. sort of thing we need to worry about that much, you know? Right. I see. And, and that seems to be a pity, because we need to think very hard about democracy, mm. what we want from democracy, and I how it should operate. Do you have any other follow-up, or I can move on? Then? No, I think we can move on to uh, the historical okay, great. aspects. So let's talk about some other Republican uh, figures. Um, so, um, specifically your relationship and your collaboration with Quentin Skinner. So in the beginning, in the preface of your first book, Republicanism, or uh, your, your main book, uh, Republicanism, um, you, you mentioned that you were sort of, um, there was, there was a mention of Skinner and the sort of collaboration that you Of course, did. yeah. Um, could you just speak a little bit about that collaboration? I mean, how did it, how did it come about in the beginning? The, this is why I remember it. I mean, these things, I remember is never wholly reliable, but, um, <laughs> I had been interested in, um, from, on purely philosophical grounds in the idea of a sort of freedom that you could not enjoy as it were in a solitary existence mm. um, in a sort of freedom that presupposed we live in society and what freedom would be and I'd been playing around with the notion of um, a freedom as as a sort of power in relation to other people that they couldn't push you around and someone about I think in the late 80s said to me you know you should read Quentin Skinner was an old friend of mine and I knew, I knew um, I knew him from my Cambridge days as a research fellow there. Mm. But uh, someone said, you should read some of his recent stuff because he's been talking about this long Republican tradition and so on, that John Pocock and others had mm -hmm. identified right. already, but offering a reinterpretation of it. And um, that's when I turned to his, he had a spate of articles on this theme. Now at the time, the way Pocock had represented the Republican tradition is believing in Isaiah Berlin's positive freedom. Right. And what Quentin did in all those articles was really critique that representation of Republican thinkers from, you know, the Romans like Cicero and the historian Sallust and Livy through to Machiavelli, especially Machiavelli and the medieval and the 17th century English thinkers, mm -hmm. arguing that when you look at their works, they are not talking about they're not talking about uh, positive freedom, however you interpret that. Mm -hmm. And what he argued at that point, if I remember, was that they're actually more focused on freedom as non-interference, something like the later liberal view. But they have this very strong difference that they think you can only achieve it mm. if you work together in a state. Right. Um, and that it's only within a free state that you can enjoy this version of freedom that is not positive freedom. And um, I think that, um, I mean, I certainly found that incredibly sort of useful. And I read all of these people and he actually gave me a reading list. I remember I, I, I educated myself at his, so to speak, at his feet uh, by reading through a lot of these people. I came to the view but I'm sure this was an interaction with him because he visited Australia in '96, and we spent quite a bit of time talking and uh, had a conference together on these themes. But I came to the view that what was distinctive about this tradition wasn't what explained the fact that they seemed to be talking about freedom as non-interference, so right. insisting that you needed a social matrix, social mm -hmm. infrastructure, you know, a free state to uphold it. Right was that actually for them what freedom meant was not non-interference, but not being under the power of another. And that's what the matrix, that's what the, the free state would give you, mm. that would enable people um, to live yeah. you know, within the exercise of the fundamental liberties and not be at the power of others, not be under the thumb of others. Mm -hmm. And equally, um, that it, um, it led people to argue that the relationship between the state itself and people should be one that has to be interference, but it should be one of at least non-dominating interference. Right. Um, so I do remember that that was, uh, for me, the, the key idea that, um, uh, you know, and I felt that Quentin's work mm. and all of the readings he was directing us to were really elucidating that theme. and. I think we see pretty well eye to eye on this. There are some differences, 
um, and in his 90, 98 book, which right. he gave as a lecture in 97, the inaugural lecture, which is the time my book appeared, right. um, we are already very close on that. I mean, he's talking about there being a new concept of freedom right. associated with the Republican tradition. I think previously he felt it wasn't a new concept, it was just a new social construction around the concept of I non-interference. See. Where do you see your where do you see your motivations in um, the conception of freedom as non-domination? So I mean Skinner, you're familiar with Skinner's sort of contextualist method. Yes. And he comes across it as this sort of historically accurate pers- yes. perspective. Whereas I think you may have some sort of normative value. You, know, you might be looking at this as as sort of the most attractive normative ideal for a political doctrine. Right. Um, and so, so did you, when you were talking to Skinner, you know, were they, were you, were you also sort of on the same page as him as saying, look, let's figure out the most sort of historically accurate conception, or were you also approaching this from what you think was the most effective or valuable sort of norm to govern society? I'd, I'd never had a sense of there being a big divide between us. I mean, partly because uh, his sort of contextualism, and in a way he's almost the inventor of contextualism, right. mythology as it's understood by many people, um, what it was most insistent on was that you should, not ha- you should not do your history, so to speak, as a history of all these figures at different mm. times attacking the same question. You know, right. as if, so to speak, there's a you know, list yeah. of questions for all time. Right. Aristotle on them, Plato on them, you know, mm-hmm. Polybius, Cicero on them. Yeah. And that's obviously um, totally well motivated. I mean, right. that in each area, in each period, people are concerned with, um, with problems that are very much associated with the era in which they live, generated by the context in which they live and so on. You have to understand that. Mm -hmm. But I don't think he's ever been averse to recognizing that, for example, someone like Hobbes in the 1640s and 1650s, writing about very specific problems in England, did conceive of himself, of course, of, as he would have said himself, of rectifying errors, you know, errors made by Aristotle or made by the scholastics, his favorite, or made, of course, by uh, people more recent, uh, more recent mm-hmm. to him. So there's there are two dimensions for any historical thinker. There's the context right. he or she operates in, and, but equally there's the all of these great political thinkers read what went before them. Right. And um, and we're in interaction in two scales, one historical, one contemporary. And I felt that the, what I learned from that approach, the Cambridge contextualism, was just to be very sensitive to the fact that contexts differ, that there right. isn't a single sort of um, um, scheme of questions that they're all addressing. The questions differ. And I think that, uh, in a way, Quentin saw the... Because he shares the normative, I mean, he's, that he's a historian doesn't mean he's not also someone with normative uh, concerns as a mm. political thinker, he certainly is. Um, and I think that he himself, um, and I, I, I certainly find this quite natural and construal, he thinks of the historical work as having helped to um, discover a way of thinking about freedom that simply had become lost, you know? Um, and I mean, even in 1987, in my own book, I was arguing that. I mean, I think there is a, a an incredible, radical break in the 17, um, 1760s, probably, you know, earlier than that, mm-hmm. in the way of thinking about freedom. I'd certainly been influenced in that sort of, you know, belief that there are these ruptures, you know, in the development of ideas by Ian Hacking, you know, whose lectures I was attended in Cambridge. and. Mm-hmm. Of course, he was someone with whom Quentin was in interaction as well. And um, that rupture, I think, is the sort of rupture that a contextualist will, will find natural to identify, you know? Mm-hmm. So just to summarize, do you see yourself as sort of engaging with these sort of previous Republican thinkers um, in, in a kind of, you know, modifying the term terminology? Um, or do you see yourself as sort of borrowing their conception for contemporary purposes? 
Um, yes, I mean, maybe I'm <laughs> less of a, certainly less of a contextualist maybe than Quentin is. Okay. So, um, yes, and so when I read um, um, Cicero talking, you know, about um, freedom and equality and there's nothing sweeter than liberty but that it needs equality, mm -hmm. um, I've, and, and uh, you know, when I read the Romans or read the commentators on the Romans, as I often do, because I'm more a consumer of history than certainly mm -hmm. not a producer of history. Right. The only real historical work I've done is, well, I suppose in some of those Republican authors, but on Hobbes, on language, which was a quite different topic. Mm -hmm. um, when I read these people, yeah, it rings to me. <laughs> I hear it as being a concern with... And I, I sort of felt once you identify the fact that what other people do to me in interfering with me, that's certainly bad, mm -hmm. assuming now, again, a, a divine sphere. But it's bad even that they have the power of doing that, even should they not right. do it. And it's not so bad if they do it, but they do it, so to speak, on my terms, you know, that are at least, you know, as in a democratic right. government. Yeah. And so the sense that you're living under the thumb of another, you know, that becomes... Um, that becomes really the, the great bone of contention when you begin to think in this way. And there is a massive shift in the 70s, 60s, 70s, 70s, um, where, you know, someone like Bentham is mm -hmm. quite clearly saying that, you know, it's interference that matters, it's absence of restraint or constraint that matters. And the subtext of that is it doesn't really matter that other people have power over you provided they don't actually use the power against you. Right. Um, that's one sort of fallout of, of that, mm -hmm. this sudden shift. And it's used explicitly, actually, in the 1770s, as you probably know, to defend the British case, to make the British case mm -hmm. against the American um, revolutionaries, if you like, by arguing that, look, um, of course, the English legislature interferes with Americans, but it interferes with the British too. Right. So what's the difference? Well, of course, the difference is, as all commentators of the time, as lots of those on the pro-American side, like Priestley, the chemist, for example, in Britain, mm -hmm. emphasized all the time, the difference is that Parliament in Britain is under some control when it comes to the laws it imposes on the British. Right. But it's under no control at all when it comes to imposing laws or taxes on the Americans, so that mm. makes it a dominating power that acts by its own arbitrium <coughs> or will, in that sense an arbitrary power in the life of the Americans. So even though there's the same interference going on, which is what is insisted upon by Bentham and his friends, and it's interference on the one hand that is representative of domination from the American point of view as they see it putting aside now all the other problems about the American seeing like actual chattel slavery. Uh, but it didn't represent uh, a dominating interference as they saw it in the case mm -hmm. of uh, in the case of the British. Mm. Cool. Yeah, that's good. So yeah, I'd just like to sort of pick up on a discussion concerning democracy and dominion. And I think you've flagged and discussed repeatedly that democracy is the best way to, in many ways to constrain an inevitably political and inevitably existing state. I was just wondering if there could perhaps be a case to be made that democracy itself could be a form of undue dominion in a sense that, uh, well, there are three levels to this. The superficial one is that, well, you don't often get what you voted for or you agree with, CF Brexit. The second tier to this would be more fundamental, that you might not agree with the rules and the operative norms according to which democracy functions. So maybe I'm a deliberative democrat and I think that this representative democracy uh, dominates me or mm. uh, basically restricts the extent of options that are available to me because I cannot will that I live in a world that is fully deliberatively democratic or adheres to some other forms of democratic institutions. And a third level, I suppose, and this is actually ironically, I think the relatively easiest to respond to level might be I want to be an anarchist or I'd like to live under a philosopher king. Why can't I do that? And therefore, there's a presumption that it might be dominated in that sense of my inability to exercise mm. that option. Mm. I think the last. Uh, this mm. third layer is probably the weakest challenge, but mm. would you think that there's a very easy response from your paradigm towards these concerns about democracy? 
With the anarchism one, I think the the response, the only response that uh, I, well, the response I find persuasive is the fact that you know we've the state of has emerged over a long mm -hmm. history, uh, probably really only stabilized in yeah. the last uh, hundred or so years. But having stabilized, it's very hard to see how you could destabilize the state. Um, states exist by virtue of one another, so to speak, but it makes it essential for any one state to exist, the fact yeah. that there are other states mm -hmm. in existence, because, you know, if a state resigned, you know, yeah. there's a wonderful Irish comic writer, Flann O'Brien, who one article took, the Irish nation re resigned yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> well, Irish, the Irish state might resign, but, you know, what would it mean for a state to resign? Uh, presumably it gives up a uh, a claim to its territory, but we all know that in the contemporary world that would be filled immediately by some some other state. Yes. And um, I think the state we just are always going to have with us at least in unforeseeable circumstances. I mean, you could have a shock to world mm -hmm. existence. Maybe climate change could induce it. I hope not. But that would actually break up things so much that you could have a world state or some sort of return to uh, mononuclear. But so I think. You know, the state is a given. Yeah. And it's not imposed on us. It's imposed on us by history, but not by the will mm. of another. States exist, so to speak, without anyone willing that they exist. Yeah. It's like gravity, therefore. You know, it's, <laughs> a, it's, a, it's a constraint on life, but it's not a, it's not a dominating sure. constraint putting out of the will of another. And that, by the way, is a strong theme in the Republican tradition, that there's a big difference between things getting in your way, so to speak. I mean, Kant has this as well. And the will of another getting in your way and how the will, being subject to the will of another is much better than being subject to, worse mm -hmm. than being subject to just natural necessity. Okay, that's anarchism. Now, on the other two, um, let's go to the other one you talked about. Well, I live in a country where, uh, you know, my side loses, for example. I would have certainly supported, I did support Labour in the Australian election yesterday. Uh, we lost. I'm disappointed, you know. Poor so the man. question is, I mean, so how am I going to think about democracy? I've lost this time. I lost the last time, you know. Well, I think here it's really important to recognize that the relationship between citizens and their government, uh, and sorry, and their, their state in a, um, in a democracy mm -hmm. is one whereby... Um, we, we all act together, it's a sort of collective action, a joint action. We all act together in going to the polls and determining, you know, who shall win, but equally in challenging government. You know, we're all free to take the government, if we think appropriate, to the courts or certainly to the media, onto the streets, you know. Um, we all go along with how things are done um, in general. Um, and to the and, and we we compete for our side winning, so to speak, our party winning under these common under this common dispensation. So it's a very unusual sort of joint action. People think of joint actions like the people on the beach, you know, who get together to rescue mm -hmm. the swimmer. There's a there's an end that we cooperate in advancing. But actually there's another sort of joint action that is just as important. Think about the joint action in in um, playing a game of tennis with another person or in two football teams playing one another. I mean, they play under common rules and presumably they've each got a common interest, the enjoyment of the game of tennis or football or whatever it is, in playing under those rules. But under the rules which they cooperate and jointly sustain, they compete uh, for their particular uh, side winning. Now, politics, democratic politics, are just like that. We each operate under rules which have been for most of us obviously inherited historically and um, we operate under those rules for our different competing ends mm -hmm. but it's really important that we value those rules and we value the dispensation that allows us to compete in that way and um, and that is we talked about this in the other day Chang that's a, mm -hmm. a sort of instability problem in democracy that people on different sides can become excessively attached to their partisan, mm -hmm. you know, allegiance, right. and not enough attached, as it were, to the patriotic um, commitment to operating under this constitution, yeah. this framework, right. this set of rules. <clears throat> now, I think that the 
when democracy works well, uh, what we often feel is that there are a set of rules that determines who is in power. There are also a set of rules and expectations, often conventions, mm. that determines what <coughs> those in power can do. So, for example, in a democracy, we assume they have to operate by rule of law. They can't make fish, fish of one and fowl of the other. They can't introduce laws that benefit their party members, but not the members of the opposite party. Mm. Um, these are there's a constant temptation, though, in partisan politics to, in a way, to 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 favour the partisan yes. over really the patria, over the you mm. know what should be the object of affection. So, for example, you know you get. I'm sorry to hit so hard. <laughs> uh, besides, I don't like politics, but say the Republicans in America. Yes. I mean, they introduced a tax uh, move uh, a year and a half ago, yeah. and it was clear. I mean, all the content is content of this, that this particular tax arrangement, I can go to details if you like, but it probably wouldn't make sense, is going to hit democratic states in particular yeah. and not those living in predominantly Republican states. That's a one instance of, it's not a breach of the formal rule of law, but it's a breach of the spirit yeah. of the rule of law. And there's always a temptation like that, mm -hmm. you know, or take America again. A Republican Party saying we will not lift the debt limit, you know, which yeah. means America would be in default. Mm -hmm. Why? Because of party advantage that this gives us. You know, we can push, we can bargain on this basis. Now, you you talked about the rules, but it's really the rules are really important. And one of the most fundamental rules, which is embodied, I think, in democratic culture everywhere, is that when I on one side of politics, maybe in government, maybe argue for a particular initiative or policy or law or whatever, I have to do so on the basis of considerations that everyone around here is going to say, are these relevant, you know? I can't do it on the basis of, let's have this sort of medical system because I'm a doctor and be really good for doctors, you know, I mean, that wouldn't pass muster. And that's already to say that actually there's an element of deliberative democracy built into the very democratic project, the project of operating yeah. under common rules or common culture in an admittedly competitive mm -hmm. way for control over government and for the, you know, uh, support <coughs> of yeah. the policies you like. But there is that sort of input already built into almost any rules um, of a deliberative democratic kind that we operate on the basis of deliberations. Now, you mentioned, I'm sorry for gone, but there are a lot of elements in your question. You mentioned about, suppose we don't like the rules, which is very often the case. Um, well, we should have a system whereby the rules are amendable mm. and we can barrack, you know, in the Australian phrase, for a change in those rules. And uh, here you have, you've got two extremes now. One is the American extreme, where it's it's too difficult, it seems to me, to change the rules, and that's constitutional yeah. or framework flaw. But I equally think it's really important that it's not too easy to change the rules, because that will give a loophole for this competitive advantage that parties are always going to seek. And so, you know, gee, if we can only change to this, electoral system, it would be much better for our party. We'd get far more seats. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, if it's too easy to change, like a 50-50 vote, you can see a party push for a referendum on a 50-50 vote, right. mm -hmm. where they can mobilize their own party, not on the basis of these will be better rules on which to relate to one another, but on the grounds of this is going to give us, you know, our party an advantage. That's bad too. Yeah. And so, and well, you know, I wrote a, a um, an article in the New Statesman about two months ago, um, arguing how sad it is that in you know the British tradition, which gave us, albeit unwritten, the great British Constitution, in which this would have been a central part that you don't put the framework mm -hmm. up for a fifty-fifty vote. In effect, that's what David Cameron did when he put up. But it had become, you might call, a quasi-constitutional framework, yeah. um, you know, belonging to the EU, up for a 50-50 vote. Why did he do it? Almost everyone says for party advantage. It was a way of, of suppressing the UKIP wing within the Conservative Party. He put the whole fortunes of the country 
up for grabs really because we all there's no there's noise in the channel a 50 50 mm. vote there's misinformation it's a crazy way to expose the rules under which we live so while i'm with you we often will not like the rules i argue I agree with you. we should be able to change them mm -hmm. but it shouldn't be too easy to change them because they're what hold us together in an essentially competitive sort of exercise of different uh, partisan policies and parties yeah, I'd just like to actually thank you for that. That's a very sophisticated answer to my sort of brief thoughts. Uh, I just want to sort of follow up on your claim about uh, the historical presence and persistence of the state, because I don't know if this makes sense, but we've often discussed or problematised in, say, recent feminist literature and whatnot, the public-private divide. Um, I was wondering if it's possible to transfer or, or identify a comparable analogous divide between the in the artificial and the natural so, so i'll explain what i mean by this in the sense that if there's a rock standing in a path on a mountain obviously you can say it's a natural impediment i didn't place it there you didn't place it there etc but you might then add that that i could have easily removed that rock or that had 10 people Good. collectively removed that rock yes, yes. and I, I guess that the analogous uh, element here is in the case of disability where it might be very hard for someone who's tetraplegic to feel as if they had four limbs naturally speaking, but you might say have the technology of fitting them with these limbs that granted them the ability to feel as if they have four limbs and so being a tetraplegic. So I suppose it's these cases where it seems natural, the limitations to freedom, as with the state, as with the rock, as with tetraplegia, but you might also argue that it's actually on a second level, an artificially induced constraint, so perhaps this might be a cause to expand or emancipate the framework of republican notion of freedom, perhaps. There are two ways in which that's relevant, a very good point. I mean, one is that um, natural obstacles are, are let's say, unintentional, unintended, unwilled uh, features of a society, natural or social, um, may not themselves be the work of will and may not be dominating directly, but of course they can be uh, occasions of domination, so they can facilitate domination. And that's what I call structural domination. Um, I think that we understand domination as, you know, between agents, it could be corporate agents and individuals, or between whatever. Uh, countries can dominate other countries, but they have to be agents to dominate in that direct sense. But for example, if you live in a society where there are sexist norms, mm. or norms that are against your ethnicity or religion or whatever, then the very, nobody created those norms, let's suppose. Yeah. But they can still be very evil and objectionable mm -hmm. norms from a Republican point of view if they actually facilitate the domination of, say, men over women mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, and it's just, I mean, actually most domination that occurs in, in society is the product, so to speak, is facilitated by various social and natural structures and I think a Republican government should be sensitive to um, changing those structures, you know. So, for example, the employment relation is, of course, uh, one area where domination, and you know, that was already a main theme in, in the 97 book, uh, where domination obviously occurs. I would say that's getting worse and worse and worse, you know. Now we have non-compete clauses, you know, in employment contracts. It means I employ you in... But if you leave voluntarily, you can't work in the same industry for so many years. Or we've got a, um, uh, these are recently introduced, these arbitration clauses, mm -hmm. which mean that you both work for me or work in my industry or my company, I'm a big mm -hmm. corporation. And it used to be the case that if you had a complaint about discrimination against, uh, I suppose you're women against you as women or against you as being of certain ethnicity or whatever it might be, um, you could bring a, a court action and a class action which are very powerful ways of rectifying mm. some injustices in employment. With the arbitration clauses, you can't do that. It's everyone on their own, you, because the clause says you can only bring a complaint against your employer before an arbitration panel that is set up on, and of course that won't allow cross-country. Um, with the death of unions, you know, yeah. we have a massive asymmetry of power between employers that are now more and more fewer as corporations um, become fewer and fewer, at least enterprises do. And so there, there's a, 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 the worst forms of domination are possible in the employment uh, relationship. 
But most of that is facilitated by uh, the way the economy, of course, mm -hmm. is structured, and by, and by these systems of law and arrangements. And you know, if you're going to tackle domination in employment relations, you have to focus on those structural features. Equally, if you're going to tackle domination, say, of a sexist kind, you've got to tackle norms of the kind that facilitate it. They're the real source of it. Or imbalances of power and so on. Yeah. So I'm going on maybe too long about that. Now the other, but I just said there are two aspects. Yeah. So, so that's one respect in which um, the Republic, any one of a Republican disposition is going to be concerned about natural or at least unintended features, social structure and natural features. So, for example, having a certain disability, sort of disability, is going to put, make you, as well, it's going to facilitate you being dominated by others, you know? The does he take sugar sort of um, domination. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there's a thing, there was a play that was quite well known in this country called Does He Take Sugar, which was emphasizing how much somebody in the position of someone disabled is actually not even treat it as a person, you know, as in you don't take, do you take sugar, but you ask the nurse, does he take sugar or whatever. Mm. Um, but the other aspect of all of these things is this. I think that if you're concerned uh, with having a, defining in law a range, and it's in law, it's not naturally given, a range of autonomous uh, personal discretionary choice, mm -hmm. which you should have, then the state can certainly protect that sphere by law and so on. But it's also got to serve an empowering as well as a protective role. And by empowering, I mean that so far as it's possible, um, I think it's a natural demand. Now, you've got to argue for this downstream, and I'm not providing the argument as such. It's totally sort of natural and compelling, it seems to me, that the state, the community via the state, should enable those who are so subject to such natural impediments or social impediments that they can't exercise the choices in this range to be enabled so far as possible to exercise those choices. Mm. And that, for example, I mean, a simple, well, it's not all that simple, but for example, the introducing um, for those who are, say, physically disabled, um, wheelchairs that are available on public purse by introducing ramps that give access to buildings, you know, that are requiring buildings to have this access of when they're of a public kind. These are massively empowering moves which are yeah. very important. And they do, as it were, they, they preempt a certain sort of domination that otherwise might might occur. And I sort of actually want to apply that structural domination account of yours to sphere of academic freedom and free speech. Uh -huh. Because I think uh, in a sphere of speech, you mentioned the sort of distinction between uh, unhindered and protected speech, and I think you, you offered a very robust defence of the latter and its importance as well. So I guess my question here is, some critics of speech as a notion or like the problematization of its manifestation would argue that there exists structural dominion in the, ironically, prevalence of certain forms of epistemically valued or publicly powerful speech, so, so the protected speech, say, of some extreme radicals on campuses might actually ironically hinder or interfere with or dominate the abilities of other individuals to both speak when they want to, but also to speak if they would want to as well. And I guess, would you argue that these are cases of structural dominion where in a local and very limited sense, there might be a permissible case of, I'm not saying in all cases, because I don't think like, the pragmatics and feasibility constraints suggest you should do in all cases, would there be some cases where the academic force or institution as an empowerer of those underrepresented, protected voices that are nevertheless now dominated by these dominant protected voices, would there be a case to restrict the dominant voices to allow for the less dominant or the so-called subaltern voices or any individuals to feel as if or actually to be undominated in that regard? covered a lot there that's a, that's a very big set of issues but let, let's talk about just a few things so when I say free speech the ideal free speech is really the ideal of protected speech not just the ideal of unhindered speech so that's exactly the Republican distinction of course right. unhindered speech means speech that no one stopped you 
saying, you know, you're yeah. dead lucky you got away with it, you know? <laughs> right. Um, that's really not going to be valuable, of course it might be valuable, but it's not going to be as valuable right. as having a protected speech, as in no one can get in your way. There's mm -hmm. a law, you know, that is not subject to anyone's thumb that would protect you. Our culture as well is really important with law. So it is that sort of freedom of speech in the Republican sense of freedom, mm -hmm. in the sense of you're not under someone's thumb when it comes to what you choose to say. That's what's really important. That's what gives you status. That's what enables you in the eyeball test to look others in the eye without reason for fear or deference. Okay, so that's one topic. Second topic is academic freedom. That's a very specific and difficult sort of issue, but here's, here's at least the way I think about it at the moment. Um, there are... The, recognize that there are issues on which there are disciplinary um, bodies of expertise, there's a training, there's a knowledge, there's a build-up, there's a tradition, you know, it can be in the sciences, it can be in history, it can be in philosophy, it can be wherever. And, um, and that it's very, very important that the traditions and the disciplines and yeah. so on in these areas be continued and be passed on generationally and that further progress, you know, in these different areas mm -hmm. which are subject to discipline inquiry and progress should continue to be made. Now, against that background, um, ask yourself what's the best way of doing that, you know, of having learning and research environments where these can continue to, to evolve in this way. Well, it should be pretty clear that um, there has to be a... Um, so you've now got a choice, right? Okay. So you've got the people who do the teaching right. in these areas, or the research in these areas, yeah. right? Plus those who work, so to speak, with them. Yeah. The apprentices in the mm -hmm. traditional sort of uh, model. Okay. So the question is, do we let them, so to speak, let the disciplines go where they wish, you know, enjoying academic freedom in that sense? Or do we say, no, no, the state should dictate, you know, what they actually do, or perhaps the university, an institution empowered and funded by the state, should itself, uh, with what ends in view? Well, perhaps social ends like... Um, now, you can see that um, th that is going to be a very bad way of regulating that sort of research, because it's got to be informed by a presumption that we know where the research should be going. We know what the truth is. You know, you get the extreme, the Lysenko type affair, you know, in yeah. Soviet science where, you know, certain sort of biology was just simply ruled yeah. out on political grounds. I mean, that's, we all agree that that's sort of mad. Okay, now back to the freedom of information, uh, sorry, the freedom of academic freedom. It is going to mean, in many areas, that majority points of view emerge uh, in disciplines and that they occlude, so to speak, in effect, more minority points of view. I mean, the complaint here, the minority point, point of view, may be, so to speak, one on the right, so to speak, like we don't give much time to intelligent design theories, as lots of people play in the States, you know, within our biology courses, for example. Or it may be on the more leftist side, you know, and, and it, it doesn't really matter, but one issue is, Shouldn't we worry about the emergence of these dominant orthodoxies in academia? And my response is to say, well, I think we should worry, but um, because, of course, you can shut out a voice altogether, you know? Um, but you ask yourself, what is the best way of regulating for giving a chance to these minority yeah. voices to emerge and have an impact in academia? And um, you're back to the hard choice. Is it the, you know, uh, the university or the state imposing? Yeah. Or is it going to be letting these people have their mm -hmm. will? In which case you ask, well, what discipline applies then? And that's where I, I've written a book with an economist, Jeffrey Brennan, called The Economy of Esteem. And I think the economy of esteem plays a powerful uh, sort of regulating motive in this way. Uh, people in academia, you know, worry a lot about how they're thought about by their peers. And um, if the standards are pretty good, as they're mm -hmm. more likely to be if it's a free area rather than imposed, 
and then they will hold one another to those standards. Yeah. So you say, okay, but couldn't that push towards orthodoxy? You know, as in, we all want to be approved, we all head more and more in the same direction, getting more and more approval. But there's a, a saving sort of aspect of the economy of esteem, which is that when, so to speak, the major centers are moving, say, towards an orthodoxy, um, there's always going to be, there's going to be a more and more powerful uh, incentive available for those who push a minority, which is that if we can overturn the orthodoxy, that's real fame, you know? Yeah. People may be pushing towards the orthodoxy for fear of disesteem, you know, of shame, of being out of the loop. But that's always going to create an incentive for those on the outer, you know, to look for their voice to get ahead. And if they can manage it, of course, they're the ones who become the, they're the ones who turn the, the, the tide and become the, the ones who are really famous, so to speak. And, you know, across the sciences, uh, you can see this sort of, uh, so I think that's the protective device written into academic freedom. Now, I'm not sure they weren't the subaltern voices you were thinking of. That's another issue, and the yeah. third sort of issue as to how far universities should be, you know, forums in mm. which any voice can be heard. I don't think universities uh, are necessarily any different from any other public forum when it comes to voices that are not tied to disciplinary expertise. I think academic freedom only applies in areas where you know, there's a, an agree, agreement that there is a discipline of inquiry, there are standards of achievement, there are checks that are accepted on all sides as the appropriate checks we should be meeting. That's the area where should academic freedom. But when it comes to just any old political viewpoint, I think I'm all for freedom of speech, but I don't think the university is any different really from anywhere else in, in, in the social world on that particular account. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Professor. That was a really, really enjoyable interview.